Good evening to all of you. As a managing director of the FERNEFA, it's a great pleasure for me to say a warm welcome here to all of you and especially to our speaker tonight, Professor Clara Kulich, PhD. Warmly welcome. Thank you. She is an associate professor at the University of Geneva and well known as a social and organizational psychologist. She's our second guest in our series, Guest Lectures by International Researchers. And tonight she will delve into the topic, Leaders from Underrepresented Social Groups, Pitfalls and Perspectives, as you can see. Her research concerns a particular individuals with an inherited low status identity and who have achieved high status through social or professional upward mobility. Her recent projects include areas of research as the glass cliff, as the managerial gender pay gap, social mobility, the queen bee phenomenon, and ambivalent sexism and leadership. Our colleague Julia Schellbauer, lecturer and researcher at the Institute of Business Administration and Psychology, will go into more details about her expertise, her academic career, and her research focus later on. At FANEFA, in our university development plan uh, for the next three years, one of our goals is to increase international networking. And one of the measures is a series of open public lectures by international researchers. Students and alumni and everybody else who is joining uh, tonight should learn about current research results from an international researcher from abroad who does not teach at the FERNEFA. The importance of internationality in research and teaching at FERNEFA should be emphasized. Research rarely works on a national level and uh, should always be considered internationally. So I'm very happy to welcome Mrs. Kudlich tonight and I'm looking forward uh, listening to you and your expertise and I will hand on now my word to Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Elfie. Yeah, I also want to uh, welcome and thank our guest speaker, Clara Kulich. Uh, yeah, as you already heard, she is Associate Professor uh, for Social Psychology at the University of Geneva. And as a social psychologist, her research interest, of course, lies in the study of groups. But she has a particular interest in those individuals uh, within these groups who, uh, sadly, have a lower status from the get-go, such as immigrants, ethnic minorities, or women. And thereby, she investigates the conditions under which minority groups can achieve a, high sta a higher status within uh, these groups or not. Um, yeah, when we think of the glass cliff phenomenon or the gender pay gap. And uh, Clara Kulich also studies the effects of sexist behavior on women's leadership ambitions and also women's ambitions, uh, women's motivations for taking collective action against that. Um, yeah, and I'm also looking forward to hear a little bit more about uh, very interesting phenomena such as um, multiple identity dynamics and the Queen Bee phenomenon. Uh, yeah, and today, uh, Professor Clara Kulich will talk to us about leaders from underrepresented groups, pitfalls and perspectives. Yeah, and I'm very, very much looking forward to the speech. This speech will take, I think, about 45 minutes. <clears throat> and if you have questions uh, during the speech, please note them and we will have time to discuss them after the lecture. Yeah, and now I pass the word to our guest speaker. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the kind words <laughs> about uh, my research and my uh, my different things I've been doing throughout my career. So I'm here today to talk about um, two of the key areas that I've been doing research on. And um, I suggest we just dive right into it. Um, so you all know probably the concept of the glass ceiling, which basically um, conceptualized 
the, the discrimination that women can face uh, in organizational hierarchies. So it talks about an invisible barrier in the form of stereotypes of discrimination, etc., that inhibit the advancements of women, but also of other underrepresented group like certain ethnic groups, etc. There are also um, other similar metaphors that refer to related phenomena. So for example, if we talk about ethnic groups in particular, we can talk about the concrete or um, bamboo ceiling. So there are a lot of terms around that describe this um, discriminatory um, situation. Just a few quick statistics. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. So for example, if we look in business, we can see um, that in the highest positions like CEO positions, we have only about 5% of women. And then in, uh, in um, positions of leadership that uh, are linked to services like HR, IT, et cetera, well, we can see there are a few more, there are between 15 and 25% uh, of women. So this is data from 3000 companies across um, 40 countries. In politics, the situation is similar. We have about 21% of heads of state uh, that are women, 31 percent of the people of the members of the of Euro, European parliaments are women so this is compared to a population where we have of course 50 percent women and if we look at um, individuals with ethnic or racial minority backgrounds or immigration backgrounds um, we are around five or six percent uh, in heads of state or um, as members of European parliaments. And this is compared to about 10% of minority, uh, ethnic minorities in the general um, population. So we do see there is still an uh, underrepresentation, underrepresentation, but we can also observe that there's change across the years. So here, for example, if we look at female board presentation across different uh, countries, we can see there is a trend that is going up. We can see different countries uh, on different levels. So I um, selected also Austria in this uh, representation, which is about in the middle of those different countries. So there is a trend that goes up and one could say that maybe um, women start actually smashing through this glass ceiling. Similar for um, ethnic and racial minority groups, there's also a trend that is upwards, but here you need to be careful to look at what kind of ethnic minority groups we are looking at. So for example, here's data from the United States, and we can see if we look at the group in the middle here, African-Americans, it's actually staying quite stable. But then for other groups like the Asian um, Indian minorities, uh, the trend is going up. So there are more and more representatives um, of those groups uh, amongst um, CEOs in the Fortune 500 uh, companies in the US. So the question I want to ask today is, does this statistical trend fully reflect the pro um, progress towards equality? So what is really going on behind those numbers? What is the quality of those uh, individuals, like the positions of those individuals uh, that make it into leadership. And then also the related question, how can we actually maintain this progress and um, help to maybe increase uh, this trend? So there are many diversity programs that are around. Um, there has been a big debate about quotas and would you have quotas in Europe now? In, this can be in political domains, but also in the business. And um, the idea is, well, we have to increase the number of representation of women in order to lead to equality. But there's already been some critiques also about um, if quotas are sufficient in doing that. Do we just need more women or do we need maybe to, to change a little bit more? There are also programs that seek um, to train women to um, make them maybe more confident, to make them more competent. And there's this belief that, well, all that women need is actually to acquire strategies 
and competences to succeed. So there are been books written, like the book Lean In by Cheryl Sandberg, or Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling, that take a more individual um, approach and that basically give the responsibility to, to women or underrepresented groups themselves to actually smash through the ceiling and um, make progress. Now, we can ask um, whether there's really a problem about lack of competence, a problem of lack of confidence or lack of ambition. And it looks like in the literature that this is not necessarily the case. So here I've put you some results of a study where participants were asked to make um, to negotiate their salary, basically. And what we could ex uh, um, um, observe in that study is uh, that, uh, indeed, men will ask for higher salaries than women do. But if you take the same people and you ask them to actually negotiate salaries for another person, for a friend, for example, then we do not find any differences between male and female participants. So it's not really about the capacity of knowing how to negotiate. It's a question of who am I negotiating for? If I'm negotiating for myself, there are stereotypes about that women should actually not put the self too much in the foreground. And um, for men, this is, this is okay, men can self-promote. And so women may, in such context, actually decide to not negotiate in a tough way because that's something that is not um, positively seen for a woman. However, if you put women into a different context and you basically tell them, well, negotiate and negotiate for someone else, this becomes something that is okay for a woman because women are supposed to care for other people and it's okay for them to, to be actually tough negotiators when it comes to um, getting good results for other people. So it seems that um, there is a, a perception of women uh, that if they negotiate and especially if it's for themselves and research has shown them that they are being perceived as less nice, as more demanding and people are actually less likely to want to work with women who behave in such ways. So if women do not show the expected competence or confidence, well, maybe it just means that women know what reactions could be like and they actually intelligently respond to a normative context where women and men are being treated differently, where they actually encounter distinct realities. So the same behavior of a woman and a man will not necessarily uh, lead to the same response for the environment. So to uh, now get into uh, the two phenomena I, I want to talk in more detail today, um, I have selected uh, the glass cliff phenomenon and the queen bee phenomenon or self-group distancing uh, phenomenon and here we will look at two different situations that actually um, illustrate what happens when women have smashed the glass ceiling and made it up to the top. To start with I would like to ask you to imagine the following situation. So you read about research that has shown that companies with more women on board have poorer performance outcomes. So you can see in this little graph, there's a CEO appointment. And um, if the woman, uh, if uh, the appointment concerns female CEOs, we can see that the performance over the months is actually not as good as the performance of the companies that have uh, appointed a male CEO. So it seems that on average, companies with female CEOs have not as good performances as companies uh, with male CEOs. And this is actually something that has been observed in reality by a journalist called Judge. And she wrote a newspaper article about it. She looked at the 100 largest companies listed at the London Stock Exchange. And she compared uh, the companies that had the most women on boards and those 
who had the fewest or no women on, on board. And she looked at uh, companies' performances and thus um, observed that companies with uh, women had worse um, performances than companies with men uh, in, in uh, executive positions. So her conclusion was that corporate Britain should be better off uh, without women on the board. So basically, she assumes that women are bad leaders and that actually women lead to bad uh, performance outcomes. But what happens if we take those um, statistics again and we look at what happens before actually those female and male CEOs have been appointed? And now we imagine that already before the appointment of those um, directors, company performance was better in companies with uh, male who decided to appoint male CEOs and would small worse in um, companies who decided to appoint a female CEO. And this is actually what uh, has happened. Um, Michelle Bryan and Alex Haslam have reanalyzed or analyzed in a more proper way the, the data that Judge had looked at. And they actually observed that this is what's going on. So there is a time perspective. If we take into account time uh, and look at what was their first, was their first bad performance and then the appointment, or was that the appointment and then the performance got bad? But we can realize that actually what's going on is that companies that are struggling, companies that have precarious um, circumstances are more likely to appoint women, but also as has been shown later on, individuals from other uh, underrepresented groups, such as ethnic minorities, um, they tend to appoint them uh, more in times of crisis following a scandal or other types of uh, difficult circumstances. So this heightens the risk of failure for those individuals. I will just give you quick um, examples, um, real life examples. So for example, in France, when Macron um, stood up for elections uh, for the second, um, for a second mandate, he was elected um, with quite a small uh, margin. So it was a crisis. There was also the, the uh, pension um, reform to be brought through. It was just after COVID. So it was a very difficult time. And he actually was looking for a female prime minister. So he was explicitly looking for a woman. It was not a question about looking for someone who is qualified. No, there was in all the press you could read, well, he wanted to find uh, a female prime minister. And he did find one, Elizabeth um, Bourne, who became the new French prime minister. And as you have maybe read uh, very recently, um, she um, quit quite recently um, this position. So potentially this could be qualified as a glass cliff um, position. Also, if you look at the UK uh, context, um, there was the Brexit. And then we had um, uh, Boris Johnson, who became um, prime minister. There were a lot of scandals around Boris uh, Johnson and who followed him. Well, first Liz Truss, female prime minister, and she uh, had to go quite quickly again. And who followed after that, this time an ethnic minority uh, prime minister. So looking at all those different situations, there is quite a crisis going on. And then um, female or ethnic minority um, leaders come, uh, come into play. In those cases, um, they, um, not, not in all, but Liz Truss and well, Elizabeth Bond can be uh, debated. Um, the, there was failure that basically followed from those difficult situations, but there's not always failure. Now, maybe let's take an example in Austria. Um, a few years back, I think it was in 2000, 2014, uh, in the book theater, there was a big financial scandal and they had to uh, select a new uh, director. And for the first time ever, it was a woman, Karen Bergman, 
but she only became the interim uh, director at the, at the beginning, the first couple of years, and then at some point uh, she became the definite um, director. And here it was the question about um, signaling, signaling and uh, change, signaling to come back to routine ways. And I guess this could be an example where it was actually quite, quite successful. So it was probably a glass cliff, but it didn't lead uh, to failure. So outcomes can be difficult, but what the glass cliff says is basically there's a higher likelihood for women, but also for other underrepresented uh, groups to become leaders in uh, difficult times. Now there's a scientific evidence um, about the glass cliff so for women but also for ethnic groups there is also research showing that it happens in different contexts in business in politics in culture the university in sports context and there is a lot of different methodology that has been used to actually demonstrate um, this phenomenon going from experimental and interview data to um, analyzing uh, election outcomes etc so the question is, why is there a glass cliff? And um, this question is very relevant because usually in the literature we talk about the phenomenon that is the think manager, think male phenomenon, um, basically saying that uh, if we think of a manager, we think of masculine uh, or men's traits. So why is this not the case um, in glass cliff context? So, for example, um, if it comes to the COVID crisis, we read a lot in the newspapers um, that it was thought that female leaders would be better qualified, that they uh, would know how to deal with um, this type of crisis. But now looking at the data again, um, actually, there's not so much of a difference between countries that had female or male leaders during COVID crisis. So there seems to be something about stereotypes, what's, what's going on. So in the literature, there are three types of motivations that have been investigated. The first one is the idea that um, we appoint um, atypical leaders because we're prejudiced and we just, we just want to see them fail. A second one, is that we want to signal change and the third one is uh, that we think that uh, atypical leaders have some specific qualities that can be useful um, in a leadership context of crisis. I will go a little bit more into detail um, concerning those three different um, motivations that may lead individuals to um, make last cliff uh, decisions. So the first one about scapegoating. So the idea is there is a crisis, it's mission impossible, and um, we want to protect um, white male peers, often the people who recruit are men and are white people. And thus we decide to appoint an atypical leader. This on the one hand, protects our in-group, but on the other hand, it also basically reinforces the negative stereotypes that those people are not very qualified and it will lead to failure. So basically uh, it's a way of giving evidence to the fact that those people can't lead. There is some evidence in the literature, not so much. Um, we have shown, for example, that um, for ethnic minorities, but also for women, that they are quite likely to be chosen as candidates in regions, in, in political um, races, um, especially by right-wing uh, parties, when they know that in that region they are very unlikely to win. So instead of sacrificing um, a valued candidate, they will put a candidate that they might have to put there, for example, because uh, there's a pressure for diversity. So we've shown that with real election data in different um, countries, there's also one experimental study that su suggests that particularly sexist um, participants will make uh, glass cliff decisions. So there is some evidence that could go uh, in that direction. Um, 
if we take real life examples again, um, let's take, for example, the, the Brexit. Um, it was a huge crisis in the UK. And following the Brexit, Theresa May was appointed as a UK Prime Minister. And um, a couple of years later, she um, basically completely failed the negotiations for the Brexit and had to leave. Another example now from business could be uh, Marisa Mayer, um, who became CEO of Yahoo when there was a huge crisis going on. And uh, in the media, it could be read that it was probably a, a job that was impossible. And after some time, she actually failed in that position and left. Now, let's turn to the second motivation uh, I mentioned. So, Another idea is that uh, maybe we choose um, women or ethnic minority groups in order to signal change in difficult times. So it's basically uh, exchanging a prototypical white male leader by someone who, who is different to show that actually, yeah, we want to bring about change. So what we did in um, experimental research is we showed to participants either a company that was doing well or we showed them a company that was doing badly and we asked them to choose from two candidates that had very similar CVs but varied in terms of the gender of the candidate for the leadership position. So it was either a man or a woman. And we, indeed we found that when company performance was bad, participants uh, pref preferred to have uh, a female um, director. Now, we were interested on what's going on in people's heads, and we asked a few questions about why they actually chose uh, the woman in that context. Did they choose it because they thought it's the most qualified person, had the best leadership style, or did they choose the person because um, she symbolizes uh, a change to the external world? So we had people rate different suggestions that went in the direction of she's being very qualified and in the direction of it's about a strategy to show that the company is aware of the problems and uh, wants to symbolize that they are on the way of change. And it was actually this uh, motivation to signal change that explained participants' choices of a woman in a context where company performance was bad. And it was not about her specific qualifications. Now, in a recent study that we have not published yet, um, we did another study where we again manipulated whether it's going well or going badly in a company. But we either say in the crisis context that there's not much uh, media attention, or we tell people that there is a high media attention with the idea that if there is high media attention and people want to signal change, then it should be in this um, context that women are prefer preferably uh, selected. If there's low media attention, so the outside world doesn't observe the company, in that case, if it's about signaling change, uh, a woman should be less likely to be selected. Now, again, we proposed different candidates. We proposed white male candidates in Switzerland, a white female candidate who is Swiss, and we also proposed um, a Swiss candidate with Turkish backgrounds in order to, um, to um, tell people that actually this is an ethnic minority um, candidate for the position. And our idea was that signaling change could play a role for both, for the female, but also the ethnic minority. Now, our results went in the expected direction as concerns um, the white uh, Swiss female. So when media attention was high and there was a crisis, um, she was more likely to be chosen than when there was no crisis or when uh, media attention was low. As concerns the Turkish ethnic minority candidate, results were a bit different. He was also more likely to be chosen when there's a crisis than when there is a no crisis, 
but there was seem to be a higher preference in the low crisis um, situation. Um, why this is the case, um, we, we are not sure, but maybe it's because um, ethnic minorities are maybe seen as less acceptable in the Swiss context. And so maybe um, people fear that if there's high attention on, um, on, on um, in this context that um, this candidate would not be so, um, so much accommodated by, by the public. But yeah, these are speculations. So the signaling change, one can also use the term window dressing that you can often find in business. Um, explanation seems to have some support in the literature. So the idea is uh, if there's a performance or political crisis, um, we will choose an atypical candidate, it signals change. And this actually um, is the motivation um, for, for the appointment of an atypical candidate. And I've listed a few uh, pieces of research um, that go in that uh, direction. Uh, for ethnic minorities, we also did some research in the political context where we could show that it's especially left-wing voters who have quite a positive image uh, or positive view of uh, women and also of uh, ethnic minority candidates who were likely to produce a glass clip. So they were more likely to choose uh, women and ethnic minority candidates in contexts uh, where it's difficult to win because they believed in their capacity uh, to, to bring about um, a change. And we also found that voters who are ethnic minority, uh, who have an ethnic minority um, background themselves were also more likely uh, to choose ethnic minority candidates in difficult times again because they believed um, in uh, the change uh, potential now if we come back to um, Emmanuel Macron and um, uh, his choice to pick um, Elizabeth Bourne as a prime minister we could also see in the media that um, it probably was about uh, signaling about showing that there's something new uh, happening. So it was about renewal and signaling change. And similar, if we look at um, what has happened to Twitter or, or X, um, they also had quite a crisis going on at the choice of uh, Linda Iaccarino as, as a new CEO. Uh, might also have been a glass cliff and again it was about signaling uh, that they um, that they are changing okay let's turn to the third uh, and last motivation that i would like to talk about today and this is about the idea that in a crisis we might choose an atypical leader because we think that they have some qualities and that can be useful in the crisis so women are associated with traits such as being good communicators, being listeners, um, knowing how to solve conflicts, or certain ethnic minority groups like Asian groups, they are also associated uh, with more collective um, traits, being more concerned about other people, being able to uh, self-sacrifice. And so the idea is uh, that maybe those traits are valued in a crisis and that's why they are being chosen. Now for Asian Americans and um, the stereotypes that, are, that they are more likely to self-sacrifice, there's been research, um, archival research that used um, press releases but also experimental research that showed that this is actually the fact. So Asian Americans are more likely to be chosen because uh, in in uh, crisis contexts, because they are being associated with self-sacrifice um, um, capacity. When it comes to to women, it's not so clear. So it seems that it depends on the type of crisis. So there is a preference of women uh, in crisis contexts, but this is not necessarily. Uh, explained by the stereotypical traits that are associated to them. There's research um, where we could show that actually female managers are not 
necessarily associated with more, more um, relational traits. So they are often viewed as quite similar to, to, to men. And um, yeah, so this area is a bit less clear of what's going on. I will make you, uh, I will show you a quick uh, illustration of, of one of the studies we did in that context. So what we did is we presented participants either with a context where there was no crisis or with a context where there was a financial crisis or with a con context where there was a relational uh, HR crisis. And then we asked them whom they would like to have as a leader in that um, context. So what we could find was that in a relational crisis, uh, women were most likely to be, be preferred, followed by a financial crisis context, and least in a no crisis context. We also manipulated leader traits, and we could find that clearly, if there's a relational crisis, we want uh, leaders with communal traits and if there is a financial crisis we want leaders with agentic traits these are more masculine um, traits such as self-confidence independent decisiveness and indeed if we look at what are the traits that are believed to be relevant to 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 for a leader to have in that context it's really the traits that explain why these uh, decisions are being made. However, if we look at leader gender, we could not find um, this mediating effect. We could not find that women were more chosen in a HR crisis context because they are linked to more communal um, behaviors or, or trade and less in, in a no crisis context because uh, they don't have those traits. So traits, behaviors didn't play a role here, which points probably to the fact that the signaling change um, motivation is a stronger predictor um, of uh, these choices. So what we can say is um, if we look behind statistics, um, there are different circumstances of leadership appointments for underrepresented groups. These circumstances are more precarious. Um, and um, in addition, there is a context that is quite masculine, quite white. And so probably the, the, the challenging challenges are quite um, different for, for women and men in um, management. Whether the glass cliff leads um, to uh, success or to a um, failure depends probably on other contextual um, issues. So if women uh, receive support in glass cliff positions, it can take them to success. If they don't receive any uh, support, well, it can lead to failure. And we have some data that uh, points in that uh, direction. Now, this is looking at it on an individual level, what happens to women uh, who are on the glass cliff, but what happens on a societal level? Do glass cliff decisions actually reinforce stereotypes? Um, does maybe explaining the glass cliff help to avoid stereotypes? Well, we did an experiment and this is what you saw at the beginning, where we either showed the glass cliff and explained to people why actually uh, women are in companies that are poor, uh, that have poorer performance than, than men, or we just showed them the effect that more female um, CEOs, um, uh, that, that companies where there were female CEOs had a worse uh, outcome than companies that are a male CEO, or we did not present them anything. And then we asked people about um, their attitudes, about that we presented them, them a scale on modern sexism. And they basically asked, for example, um, in Switzerland, discrimination against women is not a problem anymore. So if one thinks it's not a problem, it means one is higher um, in sexism. 
So what we could see is that participants who actually were exposed to the glass cliff and we explained to them what's actually going on, what is the causality, people reported lower levels of um, modern sexism than in the other two conditions. So it seems that explaining the glass cliff can help to um, avoid um, negative views. But it's also interesting to see that there is no difference between the condition where the glass cliff was not explained and um, the baseline condition. The baseline condition is basically uh, the level of sexism that people have um, um, just in their daily life without having seen any, any text. And we can see that the reading about the glass cliff does neither, um, uh, without its explanation, doesn't really uh, impact negatively, it does not increase uh, stereotypes. But we can see, so for an intervention, it could be interesting to actually explain the glass cliff to people because it makes them think differently about discrimination in the workplace. Now, how can we prevent the glass cliff? I guess one point would be to recognize in time whether there is a glass cliff, asking if other people have left a position before I'm actually being asked to take on a position, if others refuse to take on the condition, uh, the, the position, have there been recently budget cuts, conflicts, performance crisis, what's the climate like, have there been scandals? Um, if, am I asked about taking on a, a challenging, risky task that might be a mission impossible? People around um, the person that might be asked to tell you to whether they want a position could share information if there is some in official information that there is actually a risk or, of a scandal coming up or something. And if a person is already in a um, glass cliff position, the real difference is whether those people are receiving support from the environment or not, because that can make the difference whether the individual will fail or succeed in the different um, uh, in, a, in a glass cliff position. And as I alluded to, we can educate people about the causalities, explaining them what's going on um, behind the statistics. Okay, so this is about the glass cliff. Um, now I would like to uh, still talk a little bit about um, the glass, uh, the, the second phenomenon, the Queen Bean phenomenon. So here we talk about situations where women or ethnic minority groups, when they rise up in the hierarchy, basically forget a little bit about their origins and start uh, saying things like here, Julie Shipper, a Bishop, who was uh, the first female minister that was appointed in Australia, who says, well, I've never considered myself a token woman. I believe in people being promoted on merit. So basically she's saying there is, there is no discrimination. There, it's about merit. I don't see a glass clear, uh, ceiling. The number of women in the ministry will build over time. So this is not really being yeah, advocating openly that there is a problem. Also, if we take a political situation in, in, in France, in terms of ethnic minorities, um, there is Jean Messier, a French politician with Egyptian origins, who said France does not need any more immigration, it's time to close the valve. So basically someone who has benefited or his family has benefited from um, having been accepted in, in France is actually proposing to not accept any more immigrants. And similarly, in the Italian context, Tony Ivobi, who said, why should the children of foreigners become Italian just like that? It's not right. And he himself, back then in the 70s, um, um, he got into the country and he said, well, basically it was tougher. No one could get into the country without the right papers. And that today, this is not like this anymore. So he wants it to be like it was at the time, really difficult um, to get in, which is surprising because when we promote women, when we promote ethnic minorities, for example, with quotas, we are doing it 
also expecting that they will promote other women or they will promote other ethnic minorities. But this does not always seem to be the case. So the queen bee phenomenon is speaking to that phenomenon that women and members of other underrepresented social groups that are in positions of authority will tend to have uh, unfavorable, uh, unfavorable uh, attitudes and behaviors to other uh, members of the low status in group. There's also a nice film that um, shows a situation like this, the devil wears Prada. Now there are films showing those situations, but there's also a lot of uh, research that has been done um, on different contexts, for example, senior police women, context of medical doctors, in the context of different types of immigrants, African Americans in the US, etc. And basically what uh, those different pieces of research look at are attitudes, so negative attitudes towards the low status in-group, uh, no, negative attitudes as concerns equal opportunities, the denial of discrimination, but also stereotyping in terms of um, associating the traits of the high status group, masculine traits often, uh, to the self, but not so much um, to uh, other members uh, of the in-group. And also behavioral intentions such as um, not showing support for collective action to, to get to more equality. To illustrate this, we did um, a study with medical doctors. We looked at female and male doctors of different levels, so junior doctors or more senior doctors. And what we could observe is that uh, senior doctors, female senior doctors, reported um, to perceive less discrimination in terms of gender than the more junior ones. They uh, had, the senior doctors had stronger beliefs in meritocracy. So they said, well, the system is meritocratic, the best ones will get ahead. And they also reported a lower concern for, for the fate of, um, uh, of women's uh, careers compared to more junior um, physicians. And such effects were in the parent uh, for male doctors. Now, we do have this effect, but again, the question is, why is it happening? When does it happen? What's the cause of that? At the beginning, um, it was handled, uh, it was named the Queen Bee Syndrome. Syndrome is like, um, as if it was kind of a, a personality trait, something rigid that is attached to those uh, women who are behaving in such ways. And um, this is something that is enshrined actually in the stereotype of women, that women in the work context are quite quarrelsome, they cannot work to each other. But we can have some doubts about this syndrome personality um, um, interpretation of this behavior because um, it's not only happening um, for women, it's also happening for other underrepresented groups. So I said earlier on for Hindustani um, immigrants, for Portuguese immigrants, for different types of individuals who are in a low status and who rise up in the hierarchy. And also, it's not right for all female leaders, not all women who get ahead will show uh, such derogative uh, behavior. And that's why it's important to yeah, think about other potential um, explanations. And one of them is uh, to look at the context in which uh, those individuals actually uh, rise up. So what does the organizational culture look like? Do those individuals actually experience discrimination? What makes them um, have such attitudes? And uh, so there's some research um, that looks into um, the link of self-group distancing, so the queen bee behavior, and the mobility. The question is, is it actually the mobility that makes um, women become more hostile towards other women? Or is it something 
they engage already in changing their attitudes in order to prepare themselves to, to show that they are very similar to the people who are uh, higher status and to promote an unequal uh, system. And they actually already change before they, they join uh, the higher status group. So what we did in different uh, lines of research with different types of populations, here I present your research with um, the context of gender in, in uh, organizations. We looked at employees and at managers, and we particularly looked at employees who didn't want to become leaders and employees who wanted to become leaders, so who aspired to become managers and managers themselves. And what we could observe is that in terms of uh, self uh, self descriptions in terms of uh, more masculine agentic traits. Um, there was no difference in how female employees who didn't aspire to become leaders viewed themselves and women more in general. No difference. If we look at employees who had strong leadership aspirations, actually we start seeing a gap here. They view themselves as more agentic, as more with more masculine traits, then they view uh, women in general. And when it comes to uh, female managers, this gap is becoming even stronger. So there seems to be a distancing going on that women who go, go up the ladder see themselves uh, in more agentic ways than they see uh, women in general. For communal traits, um, I'm not going to go into details because results vary. Often there is no um, difference at all. Here we can see a little difference for um, employees who view themselves as more communal than they view other, uh, other women, but there is no difference there. So in general, it seems there's not distancing from the feminine aspect, but there's more a kind of assimilation to more agentic masculine traits, and the distancing is taking place uh, on this dimension. And that makes me think it's really more about assimilating to the higher status group. It's not so much as, um, as like putting aside the, the, the feminine traits or what is linked to the, the lower status in groups. It's really more about becoming more similar, closer to the high status group. So from this research, what we um, uh, took from it was um, the self-group distancing behavior, um, maybe a preparation to join a higher status group, to assimilate to group. It's a motivated response. It's not a personality trait. It's a motivated response in order to become member of the, of the new managerial group. But also it might be uh, because we are in a derogative organizational culture that is um, that has a prototype that is rather masculine and um, we try to, to, to adopt behaviors that uh, go in that direction. And indeed, um, there's research that shows that the experiences of discrimination actually uh, leads um, to display more uh, self in group distancing behaviors, Queen Bee behaviors. So there's research by Dirks and collaborators that showed when they manipulated, so they asked people, uh, women either to think about gender discrimination or to think about something more positive. And what they saw that if they made them think about the gender discrimination, they actually um, uh, reported uh, higher denials of discrimination, more masculine uh, trade attributions and lower support of uh, equal opportunities. So it seems that uh, being put into a discrimination mindset where women are not so much valued, there is a distancing taking place. And similarly, uh, we did some research in the US where we looked at perceptions of um, the diversity climate, so whether um, individual perceive the working environment to be pro-diversity, that means to um, 
to promote uh, women, to promote ethnic minorities, or if it's a context that is more anti-diversity. And what we could uh, observe, so for, for female employees, uh, they reported to, to receive um, uh, more supervisor report, uh, support if it was uh, more supervisor um, support from, from women who are managers. When it is a context uh, that is pro-diversity, then uh, in a context that is uh, more anti-diversity or not so much for gender uh, equality. And um, this was not the case, uh, what uh, male uh, employees reported. It was uh, rather uh, the opposite. They felt more supported by women in um, in an in a, um, anti-diversity um, context. And we had a similar result if we look at ethnic minorities. So here we look at ethnic minorities um, employees and ethnic minority uh, supervisors. And again, um, ethnic minorities felt more supported by ethnic minority um, supervisors in a context where there was um, pro diversity, so diversity uh, being valued in, in the organizations. So it seems that this queen bean phenomenon is really something that is very contextual. It happens when there is uh, discrimination perceived when there's an anti-diversity climate, but it does not happen in a context uh, where diversity is being valued. So these cultures that do not value diversity, that are male dominated, they actually are contexts where social identity is threatened for women and for ethnic minorities. So they rise up as managers, but they're still in a context that is masculine and white dominated. And this is threatening for women and uh, ethnic minorities. So they can take, um, they, what we have seen can um, show different um, behaviors in terms of attitudes and, and, and behaviors. Um, that go in the direction of assim assimilating to the higher status group, becoming closer, more similar to members of the higher status group, but also in terms of showing a greater distance um, to the lower status um, in-group. The question is, what is happening to identification? So here I talked about stereotyping, I talked about uh, collective action behaviors, but what about social identification, the attachment one feels to each one's group? In the literature, it has been suggested that actually queen bee behavior, self-group distancing behavior is happening because uh, women disidentify from the female group. And um, the question is, is that really what is what is going on? Is it actually women becoming managers suddenly do not identify with other women anymore and, and don't want to be considered uh, women? Well, we did a couple of studies on that question, not only with women, but also with um, ethnic minorities asking questions such as to which degree people identify with other women to which degree people identify with their high status group managers, for example. And what we find is actually mostly there is no disidentification for, from the group of origin. So women tend to be to stay identified with the group of women. So female managers are not less um, identified with women in general than uh, female uh, employees, for example. As concerns the identification with the higher status group, well, the findings are more mixed. Um, some findings are that the level of uh, identification with the high status group is on the same level as with the low uh, status group. Um, but it seems that mostly um, there is a, a tendency to, to more strongly identify uh, with a um, higher status professional group, for example, than with a low status professional group. So there is 
identification with the high status group, there is identification with the low status group, but this is basically happening for the two groups at the same time. So they are able to be identified uh, to both um, groups and they don't have the need to disidentify from the low status group. Okay, and to, to wrap uh, that up a little bit, um, so um, just um, to have a, maybe a, I think I'm just gonna, yeah, th this is one last point I wanted to say on the, on the Queen Bee, sorry, uh, on the Queen Bee uh, phenomenon. So we talked about women behaving in derogative ways, in, in negative ways to other women, but I just wanted to say a few words on the fact that what, how are women who are agentic actually being perceived by others? Because in the literature, um, there are quite some studies that show that if women uh, behave in assertive or dominant ways, they often um, are met with backlash uh, reaction. That means that they are perceived as less likable, less hireable. That, uh, for example, anger is also um, a behavior that is not so well received when it's being shown by a woman than when it is being shown by a man. And the same is the fact with competitive behaviors. And what, would, con, what one could ask is when we talk about women being queen bees or about women showing uh, those negative reactions, maybe in some ways we sometimes be, uh, perceive this as being uh, worse compared to, to male managers. So it's more about putting the bar on a different level for women and men. So I think there are two sides of the queen bean phenomenon. One is the way women and other underrepresented groups really behave like, but also uh, we need to consider how they are being uh, perceived. Okay, and now really um, wrapping up um, what, I'm, what I've been talking about. So if we look at the statistics, we need to take a more nuanced analysis of the situation. So as I illustrated with the glass cliff, under which circumstances are women or underrepresented groups being recruited? Um, what is the organizational uh, context? What is the, 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 the culture like? Is it diversity friendly? Is it discriminatory? Uh, this can actually impact on whether uh, it's a good idea to actually uh, appoint more women and underrepresented uh, groups or not, because if we appoint them, we need to do it in a, in a context that is actually diversity uh, friendly. So in terms of interventions, um, leaning in, um, I already said the question uh, to, to just promote individuals and to tell them, well, you have to, to be aggressive and lean your way in is maybe not um, the, the best way uh, to go. It might help some individuals to get ahead, but often that's particularly white women. It might help the women that are already excellent, but it really only targets specific uh, minority uh, individuals and not uh, the underrepresented groups more in general. So it doesn't take uh, to, to real uh, social change. In order to get to real social change, it's not about fixing the individuals, it's really about fixing the system so that the system better accommodates all different types of individuals. Now, what I propose to do is rather to seek empowerment of groups. So women should uh, come together in groups or other underrepresented groups should meet, should network uh, and should take action on the system and aim uh, on changing the systems. So engage more in collective strategies and help each other out and not only um, putting forward uh, the, the brilliant uh, persons. And this is something that will be much more sustainable because it will, if the system changes, this will be an advantage for the future generations coming afterwards. And that's also a way of preventing this destructive um, queen bee behavior. But it's also about allies and about uh, allies promoting an organizational uh, culture that is more 
accommodating um, diversity. So I put you uh, to conclude um, two uh, citations. One is of Monique Oué, who is the, is the director of Credit Mutuel Arkea, who said, I was fortunate enough to reach senior executive positions without feeling discriminated because of my gender. So it came as a shock to me when I realized that when asked to identify top potentials in my teams, I came up with male only lists. The teams were diverse enough, so something must have been wrong with how I looked at the subject. I promised myself I would at least identify one or two women every year, and it worked. If you look deeper and take the time to go beyond appearances, you find women with the potential to develop into leadership roles in their way at their own pace. And here another one from Pascal Sorio, who is the CEO of AstraZeneca. He basically uh, put forward um, that in order to be in innovative, um, it's important to create an inclusive culture and building a diverse workforce, only if it's inclusive, actually it allows um, minority individuals to um, develop their, own, their whole um, potential. So don't fix women, fix the system. It's a lot harder, I'm aware of that, but it's probably a lot more efficient to really gain um, a more equal um, organizational landscape. Thank you very much. Um, well, I also want to thank uh, to my uh, collaborators and funders. Without them, it would not have been possible um, to do all those different studies. Thank you very much, Professor Kulig, for this uh, very interesting and um, highly relevant speech. Unfortunately, we could not use this uh, talk as an opportunity to um, explain the Glasgow phenomenon or the Queen Bee phenomenon to, to any man, as uh, there were only women listening, I think, at least judging by the names of the listeners. But yeah, it was uh, very interesting and relevant nonetheless. So we um, now have about 20 minutes time for questions. Are there any questions in the audience? Yeah, Alexandra Sherman, you can pose yeah. a question. Hello, thank you. Yeah, firstly, thank you for the interest insights. Um, and I wonder if it also depends on the type or size of organization, whether a woman or person from underrepresented group is hired. Mm -hmm. um, so I do not have direct data on, or I don't know about any data that looked at comparing smaller or, or greater like or larger companies so the the archival data we have mostly comes from uh, large um, companies but um, we do have experimental uh, data that looks at like more yeah small um, how do you say uh, at lower leadership uh, positions. So for example, uh, Michelle Ryan did some research looking at students and the organization of a festival for students um, and found a glass cliff. So it seems to apply to different contexts also in, for example, nominating a team leader or nominating um, if there's a, a, a specific project, uh, a, different, a specific task, so it can, kick in uh, at different levels. Of course, it might be for different reasons, because as you have seen, I, I talked about this media attention signaling change um, dimension, and this is probably something that plays more in a context where, uh, yeah, where the look of the outside world is more important. So that's probably more the case in, in bigger political parties and larger companies, I, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Are there any other questions? If not, I have two myself. Okay, Martina, please. Hi, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I have a question regarding the signaling perspective, which you referred to just now. Um, as I understand it, it's about signaling to the outside of the organization with the media press releases and so on. But um, I'm wondering if if you hire another person, if you maybe also want to signal change to the to other stakeholders within the organization, the employees. If you have a, another person at the top, you might also want to show the people from the organization that there will be some change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's completely possible. I mean, in the experiments we did, we, we described the specific situation to be a bit more realistic for people. So we, we talked about uh, media attention. In another experiment, we talked about um, whether it was about symbol, uh, signaling change to investors or um, uh, competing companies. So those are the scenarios we used in uh, our different experimental studies. And in the study by Ryan, uh, Reinwald, they uh, looked at how the press yeah, whether there was more press releases than on the crisis or not. And they showed if there were more press releases and more attention to the companies, then there was more, uh, more likelihood to have um, female appointments. Yeah, I'm just yeah, thinking aloud. Uh, yeah, in the, so in the signaling change literature, it's mostly about uh, external views. Except maybe when it comes to the political context, in the political context, it's about the voters. So signaling change to the voters. So maybe that comes a little bit closer to what you are suggesting in terms of signaling change to the employees in, a, uh, in an organization. But I believe, especially if there's an uh, HR crisis, it might be more about uh, how a company communicates to, yeah, to to the employees that they that they are on the way of looking for solutions and um, better better dealing uh, with the with HR problems. Yeah, thank you. And hi, Martina. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I have another question with regard to your study with the doctors and and yeah. the seniority level. Uh, yeah. I mean, in, in a way, usually people uh, who have a lower seniority level are younger. So um, this might be, do you think there is hope kind of that the people are more educated and this flattens out? You are talking about generation, so changes in generations and changes in... Um, I think there was a study from the medical field, from the health field, where you showed that... Uh, the negative effects yeah. are not persistent for the younger generations. Yeah. Well, it's not for the younger the, the the younger ones. So they are in a lower position. They are not. They don't have like. They are not the heads of the department yet. They are like medical doctors who just came out of university studies and and uh, assistants and don't have much power compared to those who are higher up and who have the power. And it seems that those that are higher up and have the power show more uh, queen bee um, behaviors and attitudes. And your question is whether this could be a generation effect that just the people who have been around, they are older and thus have more, um, basically don't, yeah, have different um, a different ideology. Uh, education, actually, I, I would not say not necessarily the age. Uh, education, uh, I'm wondering if times are changing. Mm, yes, mm -hmm. this is kind of <laughs> in order well, to Yeah, I mean, definitely those who are higher. Phenomenon. Yeah, those who are higher, like women who are higher up, they probably had to fight their way through in quite a tough way. And there was a lot of discrimination and the younger ones maybe 
uh, exposed to a more diversity friendly environment already. Uh, and well, yeah, I mean, of course, we hope that those who are the younger ones, they will stick to their more positive views and not when they rise up, uh, get those more negative views. Um, but this is something you can only really look at. So here we have a cohort. It could be a cohort effect with other um, explaining um, explanatory um, reasons. This is something we cannot um, exclude in that uh, research. But the experimental research, um, experimental research uh, could do that, but it's quite difficult in that uh, context to really manipulate. We've tried it a lot of times and um, yeah, it's easier to work with um, correlational data and looking, comparing different groups. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank, thank you. you. But um, just a thought to the to the um, the age thing. Um, I think the first reports of the cream bee phenomenon were from the 1970s, right? So. I don't think uh, there's so much change uh, in the generations on that. Maybe it's more plausible that there's change with, within a career, so the people gain more experience and then it will even it's mm. out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm just wondering in the in the uh, so the, the research we did on immigration. On immigrants, we um, we controlled for age, and our effects were still there. So we could still see that immigrants who got the nationality of their host country, they showed more negative attitudes than uh, those who didn't get the nationality yet. Um, so here definitely it wasn't about age. Okay, so there is just little hope, Martina. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, are there any other questions? Okay, then um, I will post mine, if that's okay. Um, I was wondering if women in leadership positions um, become these queen bees and distance themselves from their, their own in-group, so from the other women, because they assimilate or maybe even identify more with the, with the higher status group, um, do they maybe also distance themselves uh, from other low status groups, such as, I don't know, immigrants or, or um, uh, ethnic minorities are there any studies on that um we don't have anything about the like gender and women in terms of ethnic minority groups we do have research on ethnic minority groups where we can see um we can no this is in the no that's more in the class we have it in the Actually, the glass cliff research we did is, but that's different. We, we saw that there is um, some kind of uh, group solidarity going on in between different uh, ethnic groups. So uh, ethnic minority participants will be supportive of any type of ethnic minority group member. So they don't necessarily have to be of the same ethnic background. So there's an intergroup solidarity going on. Um, yeah. No, I can't think really on a study that uh, looks across. Well, yeah, we have. Oh, yeah, with the Queen Bee, we have. We do have some data in the. Yeah, we have some data in the immigration sphere where we ask people about. Um, their views on their specific ethnic in-group and about immigration more generally. So that doesn't only concern their group, but immigration more generally, and we find similar effects. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, interesting. But, I mean, this could be because they consider there to be kind of a subordinate group of mm -hmm. 
immigrants in general. And so that's the way they are reasoning. And I guess this could also happen if we put women into a situation where they have to think about um, immigrants and women and you make them think about those groups as having something that connects them, like the disadvantage in the workplace, maybe then you can get, get similar effects. Mm -hmm. Instead of a common in-group model um, way of um, featuring those groups. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm. And then I was um, wondering um, the Queen Bee phenomenon um, and also the statistics on the glass ceiling. Um, they were they were all based on Western societies, right? Yeah. Um, are there any insights uh, on the situation with with Eastern societies? A more collective societies? Yeah, so I have a PhD student who is Japanese, and <laughs> we talk about this a lot. Start. Japan is very, very masculine, very um, kind of old, uh, old Japanese men uh, being at the top of all companies and everything. And there aren't just any women, so it's difficult to, to really do that analysis. But mm. I'm thinking back to what happened with the Olympic Games. There was this scandal when the Olympic Games were in Japan and the, the director of the Olympic um, committee, uh, a man, basically said something very sexist and then they uh, fired him and replaced him by a woman, which is very unusual in the Japanese context. Mm -hmm. But it was probably because all the world was looking at Japan so they had to send out a sign that they are not being sexist. And so they put this woman, this woman into a very high position, what they wouldn't do uh, internally. Um, there's also a meta-analysis that uh, shows that um, glass cliffs are more likely in uh, less equal societies. But again, most of the studies that are in there are kind of European and American, and Australia, etc. But they just looked at degrees of equality within those countries. Um, and we have some data in um, in France that shows that the more women you get in a political party so the more party representatives you have that are female the less likely becomes the the less likely a glass cliff produ produces so um, that's probably because if there are already a lot of women around it's actually nothing special to uh, promote a woman and so glass cliffs do don't yeah you can't observe mm -hmm. so many cliffs anymore. And in parties where there are very few women, like the the, the more conservative or right wing parties, there you still observe a glass cliff. So the left wing, what we showed was mm -hmm. with the left wing parties over the time, like comparing different uh, elections in the French election uh, context. Over the time, the there are less and less glass cliffs for the left wing parties because they have more and more women and so um yeah putting a woman in place is not something so different it's okay not a strategy anymore actually okay because the, the quantity makes them um ha gives them a higher status or what do you think is the mechanism no, there? the motivation to put a woman is to signal change you don't really signal a change if you put a woman because Sometimes they are women as a head, sometimes they are men. It's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There are different yeah. motives that become more interesting. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any more questions? I think that the, the time is is um, perfect uh, to end this um, event now. Thank you very much, Professor. 
Fulich for this very interesting speech. Unfortunately, um, your video image was frozen the whole time. Maybe it's oh. because of your internet connection, but uh, the audio was great and uh, we also saw your presentation, so <laughs> that's, that, that was good. Um, yeah, and uh, good luck uh, with your next projects. Um, I'm sure there will be interesting um, results as well. And yeah, uh, thank you for listening to this guest lecture. There will be more guest lectures uh, from the FAMF Harm. Uh, you will find uh, information soon at our website. And uh, this um, the session, session was uh, recorded um, and will be provided as a video on YouTube soon. Yeah. So thank you very much and have a nice evening. <laughs>